How many of you have had or know somebody that's had cancer? It's a lot. How many of you know what type of cancer it was? But for how many of you would your eyes totally glaze over if I asked you what kind of DNA mutations the cancer had? Right. Well, hopefully soon that will change, and I'm going to talk about why. And I promise I won't dance. <laughs> cancer is just cells of the body that are not doing what they should, doing what they shouldn't, or both. All of the cells of your body have rules that they live by. They have rules when they should divide, they have rules when they should die, and if they disobey these rules, there are other rules for the immune system to kill them. But when everything goes wrong, cells accumulate, some faster than others, and they form a tumour. Historically, we've looked at these tumours the only way that we could, through a microscope. Different cancers come from different tissues of the body, and of course, this is the dominant way of classifying them. But some cancers from the same tissue look very different under the microscope, so they get subclassified. Adenocarcinoma of the lung versus squamous cell carcinoma, for example. Historically, we've also treated these cancers the only way that we could, with chemotherapy and radiation. This works because although cancers are breaking some rules, they're often not breaking all of them. When cells divide, they go through a cycle. This cycle has checkpoints kind of like the TSA at the airport, only you die if you don't get past. <laughs> These checkpoints look for DNA damage that's too excessive to be repaired. And this is exactly what chemotherapy and radiotherapy inflict. They inflict huge amounts of DNA damage. And because cancer cells are rapidly dividing and going through this cycle so quickly, they don't have time to repair this damage before they hit a checkpoint. So they're told to commit suicide because they're just too damaged to live. Normal cells are either not dividing, or if they are, they're dividing very slowly. So they have time to repair the damage before they hit a checkpoint, and they're less affected. But there is, of course, some collateral damage that you all associate with side effects like hair loss and nausea. And this is because there are some normal cells that divide, like those in your hair follicles, intestinal lining, and immune system. So you can think of chemotherapy and radiotherapy as being like a carpet bombing approach damaging all cells in the body, but primarily killing your cancer cells. And it's worth it, because you can live without hair, but you can't live with a body full of cancer. But we're coming to a new age of cancer therapy, the age of precision medicine. You might have heard it popularized recently by Joe Biden as part of the Cancer Moonshot Initiative, but we as a scientific community have been working on it for years. We've been working on trying to identify ways of targeting the Achilles heel of cancer cells with therapeutics that don't harm normal cells. And this has come about by understanding the basis for cancer. And you could think about it this way. Cancer is not a disease of the breast or of the lung or wherever it may develop. It's a disease of the DNA. It just so happens that that DNA may be in a cell in the lung or breast. So what is DNA? All of you have likely heard of it, even if only from crime dramas on TV, where they retrieve it from a coffee cup and use it in a murder conviction. But why is it so important? DNA is the molecule that encodes everything that makes us what we physically are. It consists of a four-letter alphabet with about six billion total letters. About 2% of these letters are strung together into things called genes. The other 98%, for the most part, we're still trying to figure out what it does. These genes are essentially recipes that encode everything necessary to build and maintain the function of a living cell. So you can think of your DNA as the body's recipe book, with every cell in the body having the same book, but maybe using a slightly different combination of recipes. We all started from one cell too small to see. And we grew to be these large multicellular organisms with different kinds of tissues and organs that all use the exact same recipe book. And to do this, to go from one cell to a fully grown adult and then to stay alive as an adult, 
You need to copy your DNA over and over and over again so that every cell of your body gets its own copy. But the scribes of DNA, called polymerases, make errors when they do this. I mean, you try copying a book that's six billion letters long and see how many mistakes you make. With the exception of cancer caused by cigarette smoking and other carcinogens, most cancers arise due to these naturally occurring errors in copying DNA. Most errors are repaired, or they fall within the 98% of the DNA that isn't genes, or they perhaps change a gene in such a way that the final product of the recipe remains unaltered. Or they could target a gene that's perhaps not that important for that particular cell type. Because for some, maybe even most genes, it doesn't really matter if you damage them, while others have very important roles in controlling a cell's growth. So it makes sense that by understanding the function of these genes and how changes in DNA can alter that function, we can understand a lot about cancer. The completion of the first human genome, to, the, to put the entire six billion base pairs of this recipe book of ours into some kind of order, was completed back in 2001. It took 10 years and around three billion US dollars. Now with advances in technology, we can sequence many genomes in a day in a cost of around $1,000 to $2,000 each. And by using this technology to interrogate cancer, we've made huge strides forward in our understanding of how the changes in DNA give rise to cancer. Perhaps most interesting is that different cancers aren't really that different after all. They all have certain hallmarks that they need to achieve. They need to divide in a relatively uncontrolled way. They need to resist cell death evade the immune system, and a few others. And remarkably, different kinds of cancer have remarkably similar ways of achieving these hallmarks. I work in lymphoma, so I'll give you an example there. Who's heard of lymphoma? Well, when I was in grad school in New Zealand, I hadn't heard of it. I learned about this disease when my grandmother was diagnosed with it. She blew through her chemotherapy with very little response and didn't have many treatment alternatives afterwards, so she didn't last too long. At that point, I decided to make it my life's work to find new treatments for lymphoma. This journey led me to join the laboratory of Professor Margaret Shipp at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. Our goal was to identify changes in DNA in Hodgkin lymphoma. This is a disease that usually affects young adults, which by definition would include myself and a lot of others in this room. But it's actually curable in the majority of patients using chemotherapy. In fact, it's one of the better examples of just how effective chemotherapy can be. But if you're not one of those that are cured by chemotherapy, this disease can be fatal. And it's a rather hard pill to swallow when you're a young man or woman with your life ahead of you, you're told at the outset that this is a curable disease, but you're just not one of those that got cured. So this spurred us to try and understand the biology of Hodgkin lymphoma and identify new targets for therapy by looking through the lens of DNA profiling. And in doing this, we identified a change in the DNA that increased the expression of an immune molecule. And it did this by essentially increasing the number of copies of the recipe that make it. This gene, called PDL1, is a recipe for an immune molecule that gets displayed on the cell surface and essentially tells the immune system to go to sleep. Normally, this is a good thing, because your, Im your immune system can actually be quite destructive. For instance, when you've got the flu, the fever is actually part of your immune response to the virus, not caused by the virus itself. So when your, your body has cleared the infection, it needs a way of shutting down the immune response so that it doesn't cause unnecessary damage. But in the case of cancer, they can hijack, the cancer cells can hijack these signals and use them to their own advantage to shut down an immune response that may ultimately kill them. And this is exactly what we observed in Hodgkin lymphoma. And this is very interesting in Hodgkin lymphoma because these cancer cells are swimming in a sea of other immune cells, yet somehow they manage to survive. But what was more important was that there was already a drug to target this gene. 
It wasn't the usual circumstance where we had to spend five, ten years or more to develop a new therapy to get it into clinical trials. And this is because melanoma, a cancer of the skin, uses this same molecule to evade immune destruction. So scientists had recognized this, developed a drug to combat it, and taken it through early phase clinical trials and shown that it was safe to give to patients. So this meant that a group of clinical investigators could take our observation straight to Hodgkin lymphoma patients who hadn't, or hadn't been cured by their chemotherapy in the form of a clinical trial. This drug isn't really a drug in the sense that you're probably all familiar with. It's an antibody. And it works by blocking this go-to-sleep signal that's been sent by the cancer cells to the immune system. So this allows the immune system to wake up, do its job, and eradicate the cancer. And when this drug was given to these Hodgkin lymphoma patients that had a very poor prognosis, the results were amazing. It was a home run. In fact, they were so amazing that the FDA gave this breakthrough therapy designation in that setting. So this is an excellent example of precision medicine, going from DNA to treatment. It's not the only road to precision medicine, but this same road has led to significant breakthroughs in other diseases also. But let's circle back for a second. Cancer is defined by the way it looks under the microscope. Maybe it's time to rethink this approach. Much like we were back in 2001 with the completion of the first human genome, we're only really at the dawn of this new era. There's still much to be learned about what makes different cancers tick, and there are still many new therapies that need to be developed. But in order to get there, in order to lay the path to this new era of cancer treatment, maybe we should be rethinking, or at least updating, the way that we classify cancer. If cancer is a disease of the DNA, then maybe it should be classified by the DNA mutations that make it what it is. Lung cancer would still be in the lung, breast cancer would still be in the breast. But if these share common DNA alterations, and if this informs the same treatment, then surely that has to be accounted for. Right now, if you're diagnosed with cancer, your oncologist will tell you what kind of cancer you have, based upon the tissue it's from and the way it looks under the microscope. Despite all the hype of precision medicine, it's still far from commonplace to have your DNA tested. Your oncologist will then tell you what he or she recommends is the best course of treatment, usually chemotherapy and or radiation. And again, despite all the hype about precision medicine, this still remains to be the most effective course of treatment in most cases. But the future that I see, and that my colleagues see, is one where we will look at the DNA of your cancer, and you will be matched with the best therapy for you as an individual, not based upon the way it looks under the microscope, but by the DNA mutations that tell us what its greatest vulnerability is. This is precision medicine, and the only thing standing between us and this future is time, money, and medical research. Thank you. <laughs>